All right, we are going to give everyone a few minutes to sign in and get settled. Folks, we'd love to see you say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from today. I saw an awesome list from all over the place. We've got some fun. There's Eugenia's on there and Gary Horner. Woo, Je Jessica and Jim. Hi, Josh. Matt, Spencer, Liz. Hi, guys. <laughs> Right, punctual group for 9 a.m. I love it. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to preview week for Willamette, the Pinot Noir auction. The 2019 Willamette Valley wines featured in this tasting series are exclusive small lot bottlings for our wine trade auction. If you don't know about the auction and want to learn more about how to purchase these wines, you can contact Emily at the WBWA and I put her address in the chat. I would love to take a moment to thank all of our auction sponsors for their ongoing support. And a very special thank you to our Imperial sponsor, Winebow. And now I would love to introduce today's panelists representing lot number 14, Mr. Shane Moore of Grand Moraine. Representing lot number 15, Savannah Mills of Brick House. Representing lot number 16, Brent Stone of King Estate. Representing lot number 17, Leo Gabica of Sweet Cheeks Winery. Oh. Representing lot number 18, Eric Kramer of Willa Kenzie Estate. Good morning. And representing lot number 19, Shannon Gustafson of Raptor Ridge. Morning. And now I'd like to take it, kick it off to our lovely moderator, Jessica Ensworth of Northwest Wine Company. Hey guys, good morning Willamette Valley. How you doing? It's really nice to see everybody, all of our amazing winemakers and, and panelists here today. Um, thank you for those at home tuning in and uh, joining us for preview week, day two of preview week of the Willamette Valley auction, uh, Pinot Noir auction. We're so happy to have you. And we're just gonna kind of jump in a little bit and let you uh, get to know these amazing winemakers um, and th tell them a little bit about, you know, kind of who they are and a little bit about their winery. And we're gonna dive into a little bit about the 2019 vintage and how that was for them. And then finish up with uh, the specifics about each lot so that you can tempt you into buying these amazing wine lots for auction this year. And hopefully you'll be so tempted that you can't resist. So we're going to start off with a little bit in order. We're going to start off with Mr. Shane Moore from Grand Marine. Shane, good morning. How are you? Great. How are you, Jessica? Really good. Really awesome. good. Um, so we wanted to talk a little, let's, let's get a little bit about your background and about Grand Marine Winery and give us a little bit of uh, the seasoning about your philosophy and a little bit about your winery, if you would, please. Yeah. So I've been at Grand Marine since 2013, uh, the winery of, uh, was when we started the winery. So been here since the beginning, it's been awesome. And we work with two estate vineyards, um, both in the Yamhill Carlton AVA. We've got a small, smallish 35 acre vineyard around the winery. And then the Graham Rain Vineyard, our namesake vineyard is west of 47, kind of in the foothills of the, um, the coastal range over there, a um, little bit more protected over there. It's an interesting site. It's about 200 acres planted um, right next to residents, if you're familiar with that part of the world. So, and um, on the road to very good mushroom hunting, if you're into foraging. <laughs> yes, you know, I noticed. No, all my, all my mycology <laughs> stuff behind us. Chemistry um, and mushrooms kind of behind you. Section. <laughs> you're kind of in a unique section of the, of Yan Hill Carlton. It's kind of tucked in a spot that there aren't a lot of vineyard sites there. No. Um, so what, tell us a little bit about it. What, what makes that site special? Because it's really kind of, if you look at Yam Hill Carlton, um, mm -hmm. it's really kind of over here in the West. It's in a spot that's not densely populated with vineyards. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that site and what makes it special. Yeah. So yeah, it is pretty far West. It seems to get a little less wind than a lot of the um, AVA. Uh, it's just kind of tucked up, up in there so well that it's pretty protected up in there. Um, a pretty wa warmish site, um, kind of pretty kind of on par, I guess, with the rest of the AVA. But um, the, the lack of wind and, um, and some of, I guess, some of the, the soil characteristics and everything else, we, we harvest a little bit on the earlier side. 
the wines are pretty elegant. Uh, you know, one of the talking points for the Anhill Carlton AVA is often these bold, um, you know, dark fruit expressions of wine. And, and it seems like over there, um, tucked in so close to that coast range, the wines are very elegant and that suits me very well. So it's a great place for Pinot. Um, I think the terroir for Chardonnay is very special as well. Thank you. And that's marine sedimentary soil where you are? Yep, yep, the whole thing. It's pretty monolithic in that regard. <laughs> that's actually, it's positive, right? How about yeah. Savannah from Brickhouse? Would you tell us a little bit about, give us a little bit about your background and a little bit about Brickhouse and um, give us a little bit of insight, Savannah, if you would take it away. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so Brickhouse is an estate um, winery in Ribbon Ridge, founded in 1990 by my uncle, Doug Tunnell. I joined eight years ago when I escaped a cubicle, <laughs> cubicle life in Denver, um, and then basically refused to leave. So, <laughs> um, so we're a 40 acre farm. We've got about 30 acres planted in grapes. We grow Chardonnay, Gamay Noir, and Pinot Noir. Um, you know, we don't buy or sell fruit. So it's kind of an interesting challenge every year to make sure we've got blending elements. So one of the special things about this vineyard is it's very rolling and pitchy. So we've got a lot of microclimates um, and sections to work with, which is a lot of fun. And then we ferment with all native yeast, um, which has um, been cultivated here in the barn, in the old horse barn. <laughs> um, so it's a special way to make wine. They're grown here, they're fermented here by the microbes that live here, it's bottled here. You know, it's really a closed loop snapshot of, of this place. It's, um, I think, so this is in Ribbon Ridge, and I think that's, is it mostly marine sedimentary soil as well, as well there? And I yeah. think, you know, go ahead. I was just saying, we've got one tiny little block that's got a bit of volcanic. You can see the red in the soil, um, but everything else is marine sediment. And I would, I would say, uh, you know, Brickhouse kind of leads a lot of the charge in terms of biodynamic farming and is really, um, you know, Doug Tunnell, who's the owner and winemaker there has been, um, been quite a, you know, quite a, um, a force and, and voice in our industry for biodynamics in terms of being a mentor. How do you think that affects some of your winemaking decisions um, in terms of, of staying true to that, in terms of like when, especially in, a, in tougher vintages that come up, how do you deal with that? Well, we keep it very down to earth. <laughs> it's, you know, our, our approach to biodynamics is really the very basic, um, everything that lives here, we are a part of it. We're not in charge of it. And, you know, Doug and Melissa live in the brick house in the middle of the vineyard. So the choice to go organic from the beginning is an easy one. When you live in the middle of your farm, you care about what's sprayed and put and those inputs. Um, it's really a lens to look at not just the farming, but the winemaking as well. Um, you know, it can be the most beautiful fruit day on the biodynamic calendar, but if it's going to rain, we're not picking. <laughs> so it's a very practical approach here. Um, and it's, it's farming first. Thank you. That's, uh, that's excellent. Thank you for that description, Savannah. I think we're going to move over to Mr. Brent Stone from uh, King Estate. Uh, Brent, um, you guys are in a, a totally different part of the Willamette, a little more Southern and Willamette. And will you tell us a little bit about King Estate, which is really, I think, one of the great pioneering and, and um, really, you know, the, one of the, the premier wineries in this area that are really doing some neat stuff um, in terms of being innovative. So will you tell us a little bit about your background, about the winery and a couple of the things that you guys are really excited about that you've implemented in the last year? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, to your point, Jessica, we are uh, quite a bit further south than, uh, than most folks. So we're at the very southern end of the Willamette Valley. Um, we were founded in 1991, so it is our 30th anniversary this year. Um, Little background on the winery. We're, we're founded by the King family, still family owned and farmed. So we're now on the third generation of family members. Um, we, similar to Brick House, big commitment to sustainability. So we've been certified organic for 20 years. Um, in 2016, we became certified biodynamic. So we are the largest certified biodynamic vineyard in North America. So pretty big commitment to sustainability at scale. You know, some of the points you made about vintage variation, you know, it's, it's a big commitment at 1,033 acres, which is our estate size, uh, all farmed uh, biodynamically. Um, 
we see in addition to our own property, we, we work with vineyards up and down the valley. So the lot we're featuring today is actually not from the estate. We've typically done estate wines in the auction and we're, uh, we are featuring a, uh, a wine from Croft Vineyard. Um, that particular site has been a longtime partnership. We've been with them since the beginning, 30 years. So it's kind of a neat relationship there. Uh, Ed King, our owner, and Chancy Croft, I think, met in Alaska in like the 70s. So they knew each other long before they both got into wine. Uh, our director of uh, viticulture, Ray Nuclo, used to manage crop vineyards. So we know the site well. And again, it's kind of an extension of the estate. It's also an organic site, so similar farming practices. Um, and then similar to Savannah, I think uh, our approach to winemaking is um, you know, kind of very hands off, minimal intervention, uh, you know, show vintage, um, show variety, um, show site. Those, those, uh, that type of approach, I think, is pretty uniform across uh, really every vineyard we work with and uh, uh, you know, kind of seen throughout the winery. So how, and how, many, how many acres, can you repeat that again, that you guys are actually farming at King Estate? Well, so the estate is 1,033, about half that's under vine. Um, and then we have kind of a big farm to table program. So we have about 40 acres of mixed use orchards, uh, gardens. So we grow um, uh, fruits and vegetables for our restaurant. Um, uh, but yeah, under vine is about uh, 480. That's great. And then, and Croft Vineyard is a is pretty remarkable vineyard site. I think it's, it's got a really kind of a diversity in terms of what's planted there. It has a lot of Sauvignon Blanc that's really making some pretty incredible inroads into, you know, some, some, it's getting a lot of attention. So uh, where is Croft Vineyard and, and give us a little bit of background about that in terms of the lot. Yeah. So it's kind of mid Valley Monmouth area. Um, you know, the neat thing about um, this particular block, block O, it's at the very top of the vineyard and, um, you know, ironically, it, uh, it wasn't planted um, as part of some of the, um, the early plantings. I think it was a cherry orchard at one point and, uh, and the cross leased the land. And then they had uh, an issue with phylloxera, I think, and they had to go back and replant the vineyard and they actually just started up top. So they took the, the, the cherries out and they planted this, uh, this block here. Um, you see soil type similar. It's, uh, it's bell pine soil, but it's real shallow. So it sits on uh, siltstone, sandstone. So, you know, really good profile for, uh, for kind of balance, you know, balancing kind of vigor, but uh, also in, uh, in terms of water availability, the roots are able to get down there. So uh, really good so soil profile for, um, for kind of balanced growing conditions. Um, again, we, uh, we work with the Sauvignon Blanc as well. Um, we source a, a number of different um, varieties and clones, um, but uh, this one has always been a house favorite. So it's our, it's our single highest graded barrel from the vintage. So uh, awesome site and, uh, and, and hopefully a, a good barrel here. Well, thanks for bringing that to, to auction for everybody. That's a, that's a fantastic offering. Thank you so much, Brent. Mr. Leo uh, from Sweet Cheeks, how are you this morning? Doing great, yes. My, my foot's uh, feeling a little bit better, so yeah. <laughs> He's had a little, he's had a little, uh, little Achilles action. Um, he's just been working like a crazy man. And so, uh, had a little soreness there. How's everything going? That's doing good. Completely good. So. Will you tell us a little bit about your background, Leo, and, and a little bit about the Sweet Cheeks Winery and, and give us a little bit of insight into, into your operation there? Okay. Yeah. No, so I'm, I'm Leo Gabika. I'm the um, head winemaker here at Sweet Cheeks Winery. Um, I moved here and United States back in 94. Um, start working in the wine industry in 2000, um, working on the bottling line. And at that time, have no idea what's winery, what wine is. Never have a sip of wine in my life. Um, so working that, that time, the bottling line, uh, that was the September. Then the winemakers offered me a position for, I mean, a job for like uh, a harvest time. And I took that job and by mid harvest, he offered me a full-time position. And the last thing I know, I become the seller master and run the bottling line. And at that time, I'm, we were purchasing some fruits from a uh, Sweet Chicks vineyard at that time before the winery. So that's how I got to know Dan Smith, the owner. And one day he called me and offered me a job and he said, hey, I'm building a winery and I'd love to have you. So I was here from day one, I don't help putting the papers, pushing the concretes, whatever. Um, yeah, and then become assistant winemaker and 2013 when he decided, he said, it's my turn. So I think 
that's when the fun began. What what year was that when when Sweet Cheeks got started? Uh, it was two thousand five. Okay. So what's, some of what, our go ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. Um, the uh, tasting rooms opened in 2005, but the vineyard, some of the part of the vineyard have been established since 1978. Wow, that's amazing. What what area, where's Sweet Cheeks located, the vineyards? So we are neighbor with uh, a King State. So I think we're about five miles north of Grand <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I, um, I haven't met it yet, but one of these days I'll stop by and maybe taste some of your wine. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we have 42 acres planted, about 18 acres. Pinot Noir, 16 acres of uh, Pinot Gris, and six acres of Riesling, and we have small block, but acres of uh, Chardonnay. Wonderful. And what what's the soil profile like there, where you are? Um, we more the uh, the majority of the uh, property. I think we are in a Wallachensee, so more like clayish uh, type of soil. Yeah, marine sediment. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, uh, most part of the vineyards um, southeast facing, and this particular uh, block where we make this pinot is only one that's like mostly south south facing. So we have this nice early sunrise uh, exposure and all the way to sunset. So. It sounds magical. <laughs> it sounds like a great spot. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. You. And then Mr. Eric Kramer, whose uh, whose winery is hosting the auction this year, um, part of part of the Jackson family, both Will Willakenzie and Grand Marine Wineries. Um, Eric, welcome, and and can you tell us a little bit about Willakenzie and your move there, um, and what you're kind of doing new with the program, and get a little bit about your background, if you would, please, sir. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so Willikensia Estate, we are located in uh, the Amhill Carlton district, much like uh, Shane, my, my friend and colleague. Um, so Willikensia Estate was founded in uh, 1991 uh, by Bernie and Ronnie LaCroote. And it's a 400 acre ranch with, with just around about 100 acres of grapes under vine, about 75% of what we have planted here uh, on the Willikensia Estate property. Is, is Pinot Noir. Uh, we also have uh, an estate down the road called, called Jory Hills in the Dundee Hills that was planted by the Lacruz back in the early 2000s. Um, to me, some of them, if I were to kind of speak about what is unique and, and, and intriguing about Willa Kenzie, it's this diverse kind of topographically, you know, all over the place landscape that, um, where there are a series of ridge lines and draws and, and valleys and exposures that really create this multitude of expressions of Pinot that you know can be very fascinating. And Pinot you know, as, a, as, as a variety does such a, a neat job expressing its sense of place. And we just simply get a lot of really fascinating expressions as a function of the diverse nature of the landscape uh, here uh, on the Willikensee property. So we make a number of what I, you know, I call them uh, terroir specific wines. Um, the name for the winery up, it's, well, it's after the soil series, Willikensee, so uplifted marine sediments. But the soil types are certainly not the same uh, all over the property. And, um, you know, we've had some investigations done and, you know, whether it's a higher, a higher silt component in one section or a higher sand component in another section. Um, but a lot of the differences we see wine-wise are, are, are related to some of those subsurface features um, uh, as well. Uh, I joined uh, Willa Kenzie Estate in early 2017. I've been uh, in the Willamette Valley uh, since, since 2004. Um, I, I've been working in the wine industry now for a little over uh, 20 years before that. Uh, I you know, worked uh, as a geologist in the petrochemical industry um, and uh, I'm from Southeast Florida where lots of uh, lots of grapes are grown down there and um, muscadine wine is quite common along with scuppernong and um, so I had a premature midlife crisis and discovered wine and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I did. That's that's wonderful, Eric. And you you joined the team at Willa Kenzie just a few years ago. And at, one of the things that's always struck me about that vineyard side is just the diversity of the clonal selection. It seems like, um, you know, Bernie and Ronnie really put in uh, so many varieties. I mean, it's probably one of the most extensive plantings I've, I think I've ever encountered. 
Um, what do you think is, what, was that exciting to you to come into as a winemaker? And where do you think that that lends its, its hand in terms of, um, in terms of your winemaking and the, and, and the varieties that you can offer from the estate? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, so between the, uh, the topographic diversity and then the diversity of plant material that we have here, there's just so much going on at uh, Willikensee. So um, one of the things that, you know, that I've had done since, uh, since my arrival is, I would say, an optimization of the winery to help the estate you know, achieve its full potential in terms of expressing that diversity. Uh, so um, we, we have almost one fermenter for every parcel of Pinot now at this point. So I had the estate, sorry, the winery ripped apart and put back together a couple of years ago. With, uh, with the vast majority of the tanks optimized to the, you know, the, the individual kind of parcels that we've got in terms of sizing and acreage, what have you. And um, I think like we're, we're just, we're, we're really just getting started in terms of you know, where we can go here. I think one of the things that has been a, a learning experience for me is just you know, you know, working with the expression you know, of the estate. You know, the, 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 the estate wants to make these, you know, these brawny, powerful wines and, um, uh, you know, for me, I, you know, wines of, you know, texture and, and finesse and balance is kind of, it's one of the things that drives a lot of my decision-making. So um, having some infrastructure that supports that whole, that whole approach is really awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate that, Eric. It's a great description. Um, we're excited to be at your place this year. I think it's going to be a fantastic hosting for this event. Um, we're going to move over to Raptor Ridge to Shannon. Shannon, good morning. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Excellent. Um, would you, this is a, a winery that's owned by our friends, Annie and Scott Scholl. Um, will you tell us a little bit about your role there and a little bit about the winery and, and uh, what your experience is like working at Raptor Ridge? So uh, Raptor Ridge, we were started, first of all, in 1995 by Scott and Amy Scholl, and they're both still very much a part of working here. Scott's always out in the vineyard doing a lot of work, and uh, Annie is helping out in the garden and the tasting room. Uh, myself, I came here in 2017 and came on as the role of winemaker, and what I really love about working here at Raptor Ridge is we have our own estate vineyard, but we also have long-term relationships with a lot of vineyards here in the Willamette Valley. So we work with five different AVAs, uh, Shehalem, uh, Laurelwood District, which is where our state vineyard and winery are located, uh, Yamhill, Carlton, McMinnville, and Eola Amity. And it's really fun to see the expression of all these different vineyards and how different they can be from year to year. And I guess I'd say like my style of winemaking, and maybe this comes from being a twin, I really like to have the ability to take fruit from one block and have several different expressions of that. So whether it be uh, incorporating more whole stem or whole cluster um, or doing different experiments with uh, bleeding up juice, it's really fun to kind of see how different these wines can be and have different blending options. Um, and Raptor Ridge kind of has an interesting story. I mean, can you tell everybody kind of where the name came from? Because it's kind of a kind of a cool story. Well, you know, the joke kind of going around the valley is that we found velociraptor bones in the vineyard, but um, don't believe that one. Uh, it just, it kind of comes from the fact that we have a lot of birds of prey here in the Willamette Valley. I mean, often we'll be sitting here in the vineyard and we'll see offspray uh, hunting at the neighbor's uh, ponds. We'll see bald eagles regularly, red-tailed hawks, owls. Um, we also do like to help. There's a rescue here in the Willamette Valley that will release birds of prey, including owls, um, when they get to rehabilitation. And so it's really fun to come to events and learn more about those birds, but also have them go out into the vineyard and kill all the pests that are trying to take away the vineyard. <laughs> Yeah, I actually got, that was one of the first places I got to go when I first came to the Willamette on a, on a visit when I was living in Chicago, I got to come to Raptor Ridge. And I just remember that, you know, all these like horses at the bottom and it's, it's an incredible amount of birds that birds of prey that are on this site. I mean, even like, you know, 20 years ago, um, it's pretty amazing to see. And then, and also like how Annie and Scott have kept that alive and kept that eco, that ecosystem really healthy there, which is pretty Amazing. So thank you, Shannon, for sharing. Um, why don't we talk about a little bit about 2019 and everybody's experience? Let's bounce around a little bit and then we'll 
go back into auction lot order when we start talking about the wine just to keep everybody going. So um, she, um, I'm sorry, Savannah, would you talk about a little bit about your experience for 2019 as a vintage and, and uh, challenges and opportunities and things like that that came out of it that you thought made this vintage remarkable? Yeah, it was a fun one for us. Um, you know, in turn, after such a stretch of <laughs> warmer um, cleaning fermenters in shorts and t-shirts, it was kind of nice to have a more regular, <laughs> is, if there is such a thing, harvest in Oregon and um, getting to stretch out that pick for us and dodging a little rain is really Doug's comfort zone. I mean, he would never say that, but I was thinking about him. Um, it's, you know, after 30 years of working with the same vineyard, he's got a very good idea and getting to stretch out that pick allows us to take advantage of those microclimates we were talking about. We can take one acre and come back for the neighboring acre a couple of days later. And it, it gives us a chance to create blending elements um, and wines with real expression, much like Shannon was talking about, you know, pulling those, pulling those blocks apart and treating them a little different and building them back up together. Um, had a little disease pressure, um, you know, for us through um, a block that sits a little lower. So in a lot of ways, classic Oregon Ribbon Ridge experience. It was a lot of fun. Um, since I started in 2013, you know, my only experience with rain was pretty uh, dramatic, we'll say. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't know anything and I didn't know how bad it was. So it was, it was kind of interesting to see um, a true vintage where the rain can really help and extend and give, give you some time um, in some blocks, but also how to manage that in the winery. And for those at home that aren't familiar with what the disease pressure looks like in Oregon, give you a <laughs> can you give a few examples of what some of the challenges that you face in terms of in terms of a wetter vintage or where you've got some unexpected rain come through what does that look like in terms of disease pressure for you sure and especially with um if you've got vulnerable blocks or you know when you've got mature fruit that and we get a lot of rain you can get split skins and that's a recipe for spreading disease so we were fighting some botrytis um and you just have to sort. You have to you have to get extra eyes on the fruit and sort well. Okay, so we would say probably powdery mildew and some rot is really probably some of the things that we face more than other regions as a cool climate wet region. Um, and that's that's great. So thank you for that, um, Savannah. How about Brent? What was your experience down south? What was 2019 like for you? Yeah, I'd say similar to some of the things that Savannah had said, um, you know, definitely a change of pace coming off of what would have been a string of warm years, you know, 14, 15, 16, all very warm years for the valley and a different approach. So um, back to kind of more of that classic Oregon uh, vintage variation, you know, cooler year. And uh, for us, biodynamic and croft organic sites, you know, you're, um, um, you're feeling a little bit more pressure in the wet years like 19. Um, at the same time, I think some of the wines that came out of that vintage are fantastic. You know, it's definitely more in the realm of, you know, kind of classic Pinot. I think the purists um, are gonna love uh, 19, you know, lower alcohol wines, very elegant, very pretty. Um, so, but we worked around a lot of the same challenges, I think that, that Savannah had mentioned, rain events, you know, and, and not being able to kind of just um, schedule a full pick uh, every single day, like we would have in 18 or 16, where it's just like, okay, what's coming in today? You had to be a little bit more strategic. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think a lot of us who've been in Oregon were used to that approach, you know, so it was a, it was a fun one, but, um, you know, we, um, we threw a little bit more uh, at it in terms of labor, more people in the field, uh, more people sorting, you know, uh, those types of things uh, to get the fruit in. But I think, um, uh, when the dust settled, you know, we were really pleased with, with the vintage and, um, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, kind of, uh, higher acid, um, again, very, very elegant wines. So, uh, I think a success in the end. Great description, Brent. Thank you. I'm going to go to Leo just because you're kind of in a similar area. Can you give us a little chronology about like, kind of what was it, what was it from, you know, from the early part from fruit set and then kind of what was, I mean, it sounds like there was a little bit of variation in picking, but was that an earlier pick? Was it, you know, give us a little a, a chronology in terms of your experience um, for 2019. Yeah, for us, I mean, we are really have a really cool side. It's like, um, but having said that, I was like 
one of our earliest pick. Uh, we I think we picked this uh, this block uh, tank is like end of September. <clears throat> Normally it's like second week of October, so we're a couple of weeks ahead. Um, I got lucky because you know looking at the season. Um, I talked to the owner, the boss, it's like, hey, can I play with this small block? And I was like, okay, what you got in mind? So what we did is like we hang just one cluster per shoot. Um, again, it's like low yield. So um, looking at the seasons, again, like canopy management, uh, like Brett said, it's like having extra hands in the vineyard, like from the bins, sort the bins right away, pulling all the leaves, anything that's have like unripe fruits or anything that's not the quality that we're looking for. We saw it right in, from the vineyards and also through the processing. I mean, extra hands, sort the fruits. And, you know, uh, at the end, I think we are very pleased with the end result of the wine, so. That's awesome. Thank you, Leo. Is that everybody's experience? Was it like it was a little bit early pick for the most part? Is that kind of kind of a return to that end of September sort of experience? Is that kind of everybody's experience? A little bit? Uh, um, I was just looking at some of my picking dates. Uh, we started on September 6th, um, picking still Pinot. So we started early. Um, you know, it's one of my philosophies is when the seeds are brown, bring it down. And I remember just you know, it was an early start of the season. We had decent growing degree days and uh, we had a pretty wet August, but so it set us up. Yeah. Like people said, with quite a bit of um, disease pressure, even going in. So I started picking uh, on September 6th and looks like it was 21.4 bricks when we started. We finished on September 23rd um, because there were some it was funny. It was, I have like three, like four day windows where I picked a lot. And my last four day window was September 23rd and we finished at 23 and a half bricks. So like low alcohols and yeah, no acid ads. It was a actually like really nice year to make wine. Well, I, like, I, like, I like all that head nodding that I'm seeing across the, across the panel as well. And Shane, you had a little bit of challenge in 2019. Cause I think you were, weren't you a little, you had a bum, you had a, you had a pretty good. Yeah. Fall, yeah. I, I, was, I was just kind of looking at my notes from early in the season and I don't have many because I got hit by a snowboarder. <laughs> I was skiing on St. Patrick's day. It must've had something to do with the booze. Right. Um, not on my part, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, had a pretty bad leg break for a month. So um, yeah, I was, I was MIA for the first part of, of the uh, growing season. Does that cause like immense amount of panic among everybody? Like, I mean, I think that your jobs are so physical, you know, it's like, it's such a physical present job. I mean, is that something that you guys have to think about? Like just sort of like kind of keeping your systems and everything good. I mean, does that cause a lot of panic if you're, if you're experiencing something that you can't really control? Of course, you know, yeah. Um, yeah I, uh, being on crutches and being in the cellar is not safe. Uh, so <laughs> I definitely learned that, but yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, we're, we, it is a physical um, job and, you know, it's a, uh, having having something happen like that is is of course a worry you know the last year was a worry because of um the loss of sense of smell and covid so you know that that freaked us i think all out as well yeah. so of course you know our uh, we try to keep ourselves as healthy as possible for this very cool I, it's been i know it's been it's been a roller coaster a couple of years um <laughs> and uh, shannon will you tell us about your 2019 experience uh at raptor I'll definitely say this is the reason I moved to Oregon. I wanted the challenge and I wanted the cooler season. I had worked 14 harvests before moving up to Oregon and 15. And so I'd seen the drought, I'd seen the hot and I moved up here in 15. I was like, what the heck is this? Why is it so hot up here? So coming into 2019, it was nice. I love that challenge of checking multiple weather um, stations and seeing what's going on, what they're predicting and trying to figure out like, you know, let's hang this out, let's let it dry out, let's um, bring in this fruit and juggling your schedule and trying to make everything work. Because we have fruit coming from all over, it's not just coming from our state vineyard. So we have to work with other vineyard manage managers and 
schedule with them and work with their schedules also. So I, I really loved it. I thought it was a great vintage. And at the end of the day, there's such beautiful wines and they've got such beautiful perfume on them. And also like I will say too, one of the things I was just looking back on my historical weather data, we only had one day over 90. Like who doesn't love that type of weather? Um, that day was actually in June. So past that, it was all under 90 degree weather. It was an amazing summer. It was the perfect time to be in Oregon. That is such good. That's great information to share. Thank you for doing that, Shannon. That's really, I did not know that. That's that's great information to share. Um, Eric, yeah, would you yes, talk I, about... Um, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we had a, a question from the, the chat that's uh, pretty... I'm perfect. working it in. Oh, sorry. Is that the one from Liz? Yes, I was. Yeah, uh, so actually, Eric, I was right going to. Great. <laughs> Eric, I was going to ask you if you would talk about the 2019 vintage for you at Will Kenzie, but also we had a question from Liz Thatch that said, so you mainly picked early because of the rain. Would you talk about a little bit about that, those picking decisions in terms of those a little bit, you know, give, give us a little insight on how those picking decisions get made in something like 2019? Yeah, and I, so I, as we're speaking, I'm actually going back and looking at bloom dates in um, in 2019. So, and bloom in 2019 was actually fairly comparable to to this year. I think we're just a we're just a skosh earlier this year, but within a, within a few days. But we had that much more protracted growing season. To Shannon's point, not a lot of you know not a lot of really really warm days and a in a, a throwback to these wines where they get to develop flavors over this long drawn out period of time. Um, you know, for, for me, I'm looking for what's driving a picking decision is it, you know, intensity of flavor and ripeness of tannin. And the 2019s, I would say they, the, in a vintage like that, that's the kind of vintage where, where they just get there. They just get to, you know, whoever's version of physiological ripeness it is. It's, you know, uh, my interpretation of it might be a little bit different than the next person, but we're still just getting to right to that edge of physiological ripeness. I think, um, and to, you know, to, to speak about, you know, challenging, you know, whether they're cooler or perhaps a bit more damp vintages in the Willamette Valley, like, 19 or 13 or seven, I, you know, that's, you know, 2007 is perhaps the most challenging vintage I've seen here in the Willamette Valley. And those are good, you know, training opportunities for vintages like 13, welcome to the Willamette Valley, Savannah. And then, uh, you know, 2019. And I th like for me, if, if, if the fruit has not achieved physiological ripeness that you're looking for, and the rain is there, but you're comfortable with how things look physically from a disease pressure standpoint, let it ride. I mean, just let, let it hang out there. And that's, that's, you know, that's certainly the approach that I take. It, 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 it might mean a little bit more handwork in terms of setting up for a big weather event coming in, but, but that's okay. And I think, um, you know, the more you go through vintages like that here in the Willamette Valley, you realize, oh, the fruit, just let it let it go. It'll it'll be it'll be okay. And um, the 19s are to echo everything that everybody else is saying. They're just they're gorgeous, and they have um, this wonderful depth and intensity of flavor on these just finesse driven, airy, and energetic frames. And they are just fabulous. Um, and what do you think about? Give us an idea of what what Bloom would love. Like, what are the dates that you would think about for Bloom? Because we have kind of a uh, an interesting ripening window here in in the Willamette Valley. We get basically, I think, about a hundred to one hundred and ten days from yeah, kind of yeah. from Bloom to harvest is kind of our average. Yeah, um, yeah. So, give us an idea of 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 what 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 dates of uh, for Bloom. Yes. Um, Sorry. And from twenty nineteen. Yeah, so I, going back and looking at the phenology data from 2019, we're kind of around the 12th to 14th here at Willakensee, 12th, kind of 13th, 14th time frame. Of uh, which month? In 2019, June, sorry, June. Okay. Yeah, okay. I guess it was. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, I, and that that's a fair, uh, you know, every once in a while you'll see bloom happen kind of very, very tail end of May. We saw that in 2016, which kind of drove that very early vintage. Um, and it can, you know, but early June to mid June can be pretty common uh, for us. I, and I think, you know, to speak climactically about the Willamette Valley a little bit and why grape growing seems to work here pretty well is, you know, we get this 
maritime Mediterranean kind of thing that, that seems to work well, where you've got a lot of moisture during the kind of the off season where the soils get a chance to recharge and they have a lot of great water holding capacity and Willow Kenzie soils do. And then it transitions to this Mediterranean thing in the summer because people think it wanes in the Willamette Valley all the time, but it doesn't rain a lot. It's certainly not raining not very much right now. And um, so you have these dry, you know, temperate days where there's a, a nice amount of diurnal fluctuation, but then, you know, the transition periods can be dicey, you know, and you've got one transition period in June where you're transitioning out of maritime and into Mediterranean. And uh, that, that transition period can have, can fall right in the middle of bloom. And then you might get let, if, if there's some inclement weather, then you get some less crop. And we have a lot of vintage to vintage variation here. It's one of the great things about the Willamette. It's, it's such a gamble, I think, in our region too. I mean, this would just, there's so much, everything is so delicate and, and there's so much effect that can come in. It's like, you guys are just amazing that you must be on pins and needles for a lot of it. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing to watch you guys work. Um, I think we need to probably dive into the lots and talk about specifically about the lots. So we're gonna go back into order. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, Grand Moraine, lot number 14, Terminal Moraine. Uh, Mr. Moore, would you please tell us and sell us on this incredible auction lot that you've prepared? Well, well Terminal Moraine, every time I hear it, makes me really happy because, uh, so if you're a geology nerd, um, Terminal Moraine is where a glacier it reaches its most advanced place. So that's where the, the final moraine is essentially. So I always say this is our completion of our most advanced awesomeness of all the wines that we make. Um, and I, I just love the, the term terminal moraine. Um, this year we did a, a kind of a mashup of two of our other wines. Uh, we make one wine called Dropstone Pinot Noir off of our estate vineyard. And we make one we call Upland Pinot Noir off of some of the higher parts of Grand Moraine. Um, what I think are, if there was a crew classifi classification system, it would be some of the highest crews, most highly rated crews. Um, so I did uh, about a 50-50 of those two wines because uh, I always kind of wanted to put that together. And, um, and, and I, I think it really shows well with both the the vineyard um, near, so our estate vineyard is actually near Willa Kinsey, and it is a little bit more brawny, a um, little bit more structure driven. Uh, it's dry farmed on really sandy soil, so it struggles hard, and it always has a ton of acidity. So uh, um, 2019, we picked it, I think it was the 15th of September, I just wrote down, and it was 22 bricks and like a pH of 3.2, and um, tiny, tiny little berries. So a lot of structure, a lot of power there. And then off of our other vineyard, I kind of talked about some elegance off the Grand Moraine vineyard. And um, these, these um, wines from there are really just kind of texturally driven in terms of, um, they're almost spherical, kind of like some of my Zena Crown wines are, and um, quite opulent. So I think it's a cool juxtaposition. The wine's showing beautifully today. It's just got a lot of tertiary components. It's, it's got great structure and great fruit. Um, this one will pull the distance too, I think. I'll, I'll definitely have some of this in my cellar. Will you give us some magical buzzwords on the nose and the palate and the finish in terms of just give us some descriptions and what, what our drinkers and buyers can expect um, from, from this wine? Yeah, so the, the nose is like really brambly and, and has a little touch of like maybe like pearl gray tea and uh, maybe some like hot soil, like, you know, when soil's like, like yesterday that um, we always think about, you know, when we smell kind of that wet rock, well, I think soil being hot has a, has an interesting aroma as well. I mean, I don't know if we have a word for that. There's petrichor, right? Am I, I don't know. Yeah, petrichor, petrichor to me is like something that like when it, when, when it gets, when the rain falls on it, it gets wet. So yeah, that's exactly. Like kind of that wet, you know, so wet we, soil. Well, we have a name for that, but we don't have a name for just like summertime dirt. soil. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's fun. And then on the palate, it's, it's structured. It's, uh, it's, it's not like, you know, one of those warm vintages that are just like all encompassing. It's definitely structured and it's definitely, um, uh, precise. Okay. So and are you getting more like, is this more blue fruited, purple fruited, red fruited, and then give us the finish, the big finale on the this. Green wines, Jessica, have all the fruits, blue, red, black, and green. 
and definitely right there. And then on the finish, it's definitely, it's pulling toward the finish with uh, almost like a citrus peel tannin. And then, and then I was kind of my favorite Pinots that we make crash forward, um, kind of like a, a ocean wave. This one definitely crashes forward with a lot of like um, raspberry and blueberry. Um, awesome. Awesome. So that was lot number 14, Grand Moraine, Terminal Moraine, five case Pinot Noir lot. Um, let's move to lot number 15, Savannah Brick House, the Quantrell, also five case lot. Give us our, give us your assessment of your, of the wine you made, please. Well, the name comes from um, my label that I make on the side um, with just one ton of fruit. So just a couple of barrels a year. Um, and it's really my place to play. And that project sort of advanced in 2018 when I took over farming a block um, in the northwest corner of our property. It's um, 0.67 acres. Um, it's called the Triangle. It's Dijon 115. And it's a funny little block. It's, um, there are these, it's 16 rows. Um, the top ones are the longer ones against the fence, fairly shaded. Um, and you really need to farm them differently than the 10, you know, 10 rows later where we've got the shorter rows, um, but they're in a little bit of a wet spot. They're very vigorous. Um, so for the last four years, we've been, um, my husband and I have been farming that ourselves and it's been an education for one, <laughs> but also um, just really great to get your hands in the vines and, and, having the opportunity to do that has been a lot of fun. Um, so this was harvested on September 30th. It was the last pick that we made. Um, and similar to our auction lot from last year, the idea being um, a very clear expression. Um, the Cantrell line is supposed to be fun and flirtatious. And this, the 19s definitely played into that. And um, this is from my favorite barrel of the three we made that year. Um, it's 0% whole cluster, neutral barrel, and to the idea, just a very clean, clear expression of one block, just nothing in the way. Um, it's, it's got great acid structure. It's very red fruited. And I agree with Shane that soil has a smell. And I think it's also a very classic ribbon ridge note you get on on noses here is sort of that mix of cranberry and dust and soil um which i love and yeah it's it's showing great it's taking some time to open up um but i think with that acid structure it's it's gonna last but it's just very clean well, you, I think, I think that Ribbon Ridge really has a, a lot of the marine sediment soils have a really distinctive finish. It's a, it's really distinctive. And so what, how would you characterize the finish on this wine and how long is it? And then also, would you give us a little, just a little, uh, explain what Kentrell actually means so that we can, we decipher that for us? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, the finish on, on Ribbon Ridge wines, I think, is a continuation of that sort of chalky lift. Um, and this being Dijon 115, I think of the Dijon clones that we grow, it stands alone the best. Um, and it's a very lifted finish, um, which is pretty classic of our Dijon fruit, um, just kind of upticks right at the end. And um, Cantrell is um, an old French word we dug up that basically um, describes a woman who loves life's pleasures and, um, you know, food and wine and um, gatherings, etc. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a perfect way to wrap up this lot. So this is lot number 15 from Brick House, from Doug Tunnell and Savannah Mills, um, the Cantrell five case lot. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Savannah. Um, let's move over to King Estate to Brent Stone, block, block O. That block O, not block zero, block O. Um, and this is a five K slot. Brent, will you tell us about, about this wine, please, that you made? Yeah, so it's named uh, after the vineyard block and clone in which the grapes were sourced. So it's uh, Croft, Block O, Pomard. Um, let me think. So, um, you know, a lot of what we do here at King Estate, again, with biodynamic organic winemaking is 
you know, you want to show the site, you want to show the vintage, you want to show the cologne, you know, so as much as you can do to really just kind of get out of the way and, and let those things come through. I think we all uh, got into Pinot Noir. What we love about Pinot is it, is it shows those things probably more than any other variety. So uh, that was our goal here with this wine. Um, the way we're set up as a winery, some of what uh, Eric had described about the Willa Kenzie, I think uh, we have some similar features here at King Estate. Although we've grown to be kind of a bigger producer in the state, we've um, our fermenter size has stayed the same since the 90s. So we have this series of we have hundreds, literally, of these small fermenters. So what that allows us to do is every block, every clone, every variety, every vineyard gets its own fermenter. And um, that's kept separate all the way to Elevage, all the way to barrel. So we literally run probably 400 fermentations during harvest. Um, everything goes to barrel. And then we do this series of kind of grading. We do that as a winemaking team. So there's five of us. We do it blind. Um, and it's almost kind of this, you know, Bordeaux model where, we're, where we grade out um, programs. And so across five blind winemakers, um, this particular barrel from Croft uh, was the consensus number one of the vintage. So we're like, okay, let's, let's set this aside. This be a great uh, barrel for the, for the auction. So um, that's why we decided to go with Croft Vineyard uh, for this particular uh, vintage and event. Um, let me see, in terms of Elevage, it's uh, about 19, 20 months. We just bottled it last month. So uh, the, the barrels of Mercury selection, uh, Nicola, which, uh, you know, in our opinion, actually does a little bit better with, uh, with some extra time in barrel. So that 19, 20 months, I think was appropriate for, for the barrel and for the vintage being kind of a, a higher asset. I think it kind of softened the wine a little bit, that extra barrel time. Um, let me see in terms of flavor profile. So it's definitely kind of that classic pomard, you know, it's darker fruit. Um, but the, the lower alcohol, um, kind of uh, cooler vintage, you know, it's definitely um, uh, almost floral on the nose, which is pretty neat. Um, and then what we've noticed about Croft is that as it ages, you know, that almost becomes a little bit um, uh, kind of rustic. So it, it starts to show these like truffly type characters. And, uh, the wife and I are drinking a 2012 Croft right now, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's that balance between kind of like fruit and and, uh, and that kind of rustic nature of, of Pinot Noir as it ages, which I think um, a, a lot of us are attracted to. So um, uh, despite the extra barrel time, there's still a lot of uh, acidity in the wine. So that does wonders for the finish, you know, kind of helps carry the, the finish. But the, uh, the early ripening nature of uh, Pomard, I think, um, got the tannins uh, right where they needed to be uh, for this particular vintage. So, uh, you know, we're, we're proud of the wine and, uh, and uh, hope folks uh, have samples and, and, and have a chance to try it here this morning. Nothing like drinking Pinot at 9 a.m. So, <laughs> uh, Brent, I think Pomard seems to be, it, it has been over over time, has been kind of a darling of the valley. Um, and you were talking about the tannic structure. Can you give us a little bit more meat on that on terms of how, how Pomard performs as a, as a variety, as a clone, um, in, and in terms of the, 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 the overall structure with the tannins, especially from Croft Vineyard? Can you give us a little more meat on that? Yeah, what we've noticed with Croft and, and really, I guess, Pomard as a clone, you know, being, it kind of comes on a little earlier, ripens a little earlier, and you get ripe tannins earlier. So relative to kind of a sugar ripeness, you get that uh, physiological ripeness, uh, that balance probably more so in Pomard. And in a cooler vintage like 19, I think it's going to do uh, very well. And I think that's why it's done so well year over year in Oregon, just um, more prone to vintage variation, cooler years. Um, uh, a, a clone like Pomard is just very well suited, I think, to the growing conditions in the valley. So it's been a house favorite here for us. I mean, we work with probably a dozen different clones, not only in our, in our own vineyard, but up and down the valley. And um, it's definitely um, one of the preferred clones uh, and one of our favorite sites in, in crop. Okay. Thank you so much. And the fruit profile on this, would just, kind of where is it lean? Yeah, definitely towards the dark fruit, again, on the nose, again, being a little bit, um, you know, not showing as much of the dark fruit, almost tending towards kind of a floral, which is nice. Um, and, and if I had to call it, I'd say it'd be similar to other vintages across where uh, as it gets some more bottle time, it's going to get uh, a little bit more rustic as it uh, ages. Great description. And I hope you guys at home are tasting through it. And uh, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Um, that is King Estate lot number 16 block Oh, which is a five case lot. And we're gonna move over to our friend, Leo Gabica at Wild Child, lot number 17 from Sweet Cheeks Winery. And this is a 20 case lot. So this is a, this is, this is a, a bigger endeavor. So Leo, tell us about, about, your, about your wine and your winemaking vinification of this, of this awesome lot that you put together. Uh, like, yeah, like, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, 
get a chance to play with this uh, small block um, hanging one cluster per shoot, um, especially for the 2019 vintage. I think it helps the uh, the ripening a little bit early. Um, again, it's like not not a lot of like I know a special winemaking style, but uh, inoculated with um, commercial yeast. Um, 19, 18 months in barrel. Um, I think the wine shows, this is like, I would say a classic example of a cooler climate Pinot Noir. Um, it shows a lot of like bright cherry in the nose, um, cranberries, but yet have this night bright acid in the finish. That's kind of giving more length. Leo, why don't we have you turn on You're cutting off. Hello. Jess, did we did we lose you for a second? Can you hear me? Can you hear Leo? Yeah. Okay. Jess, we lost so, you for a sec. I know. I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that. I thought it was I thought it was everybody else's connection. <laughs> I'm like right next to my modem. Um and why why choose to do a 20 case lot in a vintage? It sounds like you guys had had not as much not as much fruit on the vine. Um, again, like um, I think this is one of the this is this one of the small the smaller lot. Um, I think harvest we only did maybe just over um, a ton for this block. Um, I think again the the, the wine shows. A, a prime example, a classic example of a cooler um, site Pinot Noir. Um, again, show this night bright cherry cranberry. Um, again, like everybody says, like the 2019s is like, you know, acid is your friend. I think this wine shows uh, a great bright acid in the finish, but having let it set in the barrels for about 18 man months, help the acid to soften a little bit more. I um, think, again, the finish, you can get this hint of a little bit of coffee, maybe a hint of a chocolate. Um, this wine also, what I think to me, is like it probably benefits to like put it in your cellar, put, hide it in your closet, and then open it maybe when your anniversary, birthday, Thanksgiving, or Christmas, and share it with your friends. I love it, Leo. That's a great description. Thank you so much. And uh, that is Sweet Cheeks, lot number 17, Wild Child, uh, 20K slot. Very generous donation from Leo and the, and the team at Sweet Cheeks. So we thank you for that. Thank you, Leo. Um, we're going to move over to Willa Kenzie, to Mr. Eric Kramer. Rise Over Run, which is the nerdiest of nerds. I love it. You got to tell us about this lot. Um, lot number 18, 5K slot from Willa Kenzie. Yeah, so we started getting a little nerdy last year, so we figured we'd, we'd just keep, we'd go just full nerd uh, this year. So um, this particular one, so, you know, I had spoken before a bit about the kind of the dynamic nature of the Willa Kenzie Estate property, uh, you know, bench top here, a ridge line here, a ridge line there. Uh, there's a very steeply facing southerly exposure where the kind of the apex hits near the, the, the highest part of the estate. Um, at about 740 some odd feet. Um, and it bottoms out at around, I don't know, 450, 480 feet or something like that. We have a number of different parcels planted uh, along this, this escarpment. And um, that we make a terroir specific wine from that part of the estate called Triple Black Slopes. So you remember that, that math class you had, rise, rise, rise over run. So I did, we're coming up with the dorky name and we wanted to go full dork. So Rise Over Run is meant to at least, you know, point to the part of the estate where this particular wine comes from. Uh, during the 2019 vintage, as we were, um, you know, I would say kind of winding down with harvest, but during, in, in conjunction with settling and before barreling down, you have a chance to, you know, you, you have a chance to assess everything that you have. And I remember um, tasting the, the wines from that part of the estate in 2019 and saying to myself, oh my gosh, the, the 2019 stuff off of Triple Black is 
so good and so exciting. And I think one of the things that I found really neat, uh, you know, that was what, so 1970, that was my third vintage here, um, was, was the, the intensity, but the restraint that came off of that part of the estate in that year. And it, it, in a warmer year, this wine, you know, the wine coming off of triple black, powerful and intense, the, you know, the berries are very small, the soils thin. So you have the, as, you know, you have the aspect and exposure, you have the soil depth, you have the wind. So you have this naturally devigorating kind of an environment that creates intense power. Uh, but in a cooler vintage, there, there's this great intensity of flavor, but the frame is a lot more airy than and ethereal than I was expecting. And so I, and, and I, it's, it was a, I thought it'd be a fun wine to, to get to share. So this particular wine, uh, Rise Over Run, is coming from three distinct parcels and we wanted to put together a really unique, um, unique expression from that part of the estate. So it's equal amounts, uh, 114, 777 and 667 put together in a pretty deliberate manner. Um, yeah. So what do you think, Eric, how would you describe if, if aromatically the mouth on this and then the finish, like give us, sell us this, sell us this lot in terms of what should be expected in the glass? Yeah. So I, I, I opened, I actually opened this wine yesterday because I was curious about it and I, you know, watched it, you know, over the course of the last 12, 18 hours and it's continuing to evolve, but it's, um, but it's a very, uh, for, for that part of it, it's a very red fruit ex expression from this vintage. And there's a lot of kind of like, I would say Bing cherry is one of the first things that comes to mind, but there's definitely this dis distinctly savory through line that is uniquely Willa Kenzie that, um, that I absolutely adore. And there are certainly comes to these piney, cedary kinds of notes that, I, that are picking up uh, you know, aromatically. So there's a really complex aromatic expression in there. In, in, texturally and in the mouth, the wine enters with a lot of intensity of flavor and those flavors kind of carry through. Uh, and, but there's this, you know, there's this juicy kind of punchy acidity that's certainly a reflection uh, of the vintage, but this just long drawn out kind of tapered finish that just goes on for, for a while on, on these really just gorgeous tannins. That's a good, great description. It's making me it's making me salivate thinking about it. I can't wait to try it. Um, uh, guys, this was uh, lot number 18, Willa Kenzie Estate, Rise Over Run, 5K slot of Pinot Noir. Um, and thank you, Eric, for that great description. And last but not least, from Raptor Ridge, lot number 19, Tour de Valet. Uh, this is a, a 5K slot from Shannon. Shannon, would you tell us a, a little bit about your wine and, and your process? Yeah, so this probably was born because of the pandemic and our desire to get out and see more things. But uh, ultimately, Tour de Valet, it's a tour of the Willamette Valley. We really love how the different vineyards play with each other. And like Eric, I opened my bottle yesterday just to kind of see where it was at and what was going on with it. And also to give you guys some good descriptors of where this is and kind of try and figure out what vineyards contributing what to this. Um, so this is literally every vineyard that we work with and uh, what I would say is coming from our Laurelwood district and Chahila Mountains, which is where we typically pick our first fruits from, um, we get a lot more of that cherry skin kind of characteristic and a little bit of cinnamon. They usually have a lot softer tannins on them. Moving over to Yamhill Carlton, uh, we have a little bit more of that blue fruit, blueberry, um, a lot of floral attributes. So rose petals and violets. Uh, moving down to uh, where we have our competitors for last picks, we have McMinnville, which is a lot more concentrated, typically has a black cherry-like characteristic, and it always brings the acid. It never fails. Um, going right over to Eola Amity, we work with several vineyards in Eola Amity, and they have a combination of that forest floor, more earthy characteristics. Um, they also bring a little bit of um, spice box, cigar box, and a lot more acidity to them. So we love how they all play together and make this beautiful tour of the Willamette Valley. And we just thought, what a cool idea. And fortunately, in tasting everything blind, this was the wine that we loved. And we're like, well, 2019, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic deconstruction of all of those areas. And thank you for that great description. In terms of bringing those together and then putting that, what was what was the, some of the decisions that you made in the winemaking and the elevage um, that, that finished the wine? One of the 
the things that we do here is we like to free run from our tanks before going to press and then have press slots. And so those wines show very differently. And so the free run tends to have a lot more floral and they're a lot showier. They don't have as much of the tannin uh, coming forth in them compared to the press slot. You get a lot more tannin coming from the press slots. Um, we also are not as big on using a lot of new oak. So this is not covered with a bunch of oak. I really like to let the Pinot show. So you'll see in this wine, it was aged for 12 months in barrel and it has this nice, really fruit forward characteristic to it. And also really some beautiful um, floral aspects. I think with the acidity and probably on everybody else's lots, I haven't had a chance to taste them all, but I think what you'll find about the 2019s is these are gonna be great wines that are gonna really hold up and they're gonna pair well with food. Awesome description. I think it's so, I, it's like all of these things that are happening. I, I hope that all of you, like I'm, I'm tempted, I wanna make sure that we all taste each other's wines because I think you've sold them brilliantly. And I can't wait to try the variation. Um, I think that's one of the things that I loved about this panel specifically is we had such variety in terms of region and size and, and some of the different, um, you know, just practices overall. But really, I mean, I think you guys have done just a beautiful job and I cannot thank you enough for donating your artwork to this auction. Um, we are so grateful to you and, um, and want to just say thank you. If, if there's anything in the chat that anybody wants to know about, let us know. Miss Julia Burke, our hostess with the mostest, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being such a great, uh, Julia put all this stuff together and she's just been just a powerhouse. So thank you, Miss Julia. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much for all your work being an amazing moderator. Panelists, thank you so much for your time, your brilliance and, and your wine. Um, I'm just really thrilled about this event and I just am super grateful. Uh, for those of uh, those of you watching who are joining us next week, we can't wait to see you in, virtually or in person on August 5th. Thank you to all who attended. I did drop the uh, preview week schedule in the chat in case you want to join us for a few more sessions this week. We're going all week with some pretty amazing conversations. And um, once again, thank you panelists. Thank you attendees. Cheers. Thanks guys. See you in a week. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Good, Mackenzie. <laughs>